Okay, and it's a great pleasure again to have Pete Erickson as our lecturer for snow travel, avalanche awareness, and crevasse rescue. Pete, long-standing mountaineer, climb leader, and snow enthusiast, uh, will share his knowledge about something he really, really enjoys doing. So without much further ado, uh, it's on you, Pete. Thank you, Jan. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Pete Erickson, and I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm a volunteer with the Mountaineers. I took the basic course in 2012, the intermediate course in 2014. And I love teaching this snow section because in, in the basic class, when I took it more than any other unit of the course, the snow skills expanded my idea of the mountains, expanded my ability to enjoy the mountains more than anything else. Because I came to mountaineering from hiking. You know, I could hike three months a year, July, August, September in the Cascades before. And then all of a sudden it went to 12 months, right? So the, just the amount of adventure, the amount of enjoyment that I got out of these skills has been immense and is why I love to come back um, every year and talk about it more. So, um, <clears throat> you know, there are going to be a lot of photos in this um, lecture, and that's because I, you know, love this landscape so much. And <clears throat> lots of these photos are from actual basic snow climbs that you could, in theory, do in this course if you know, if someone leads it and you're you're able to go on that climb. So that's to help whet your appetite a little bit. Um, but to start, I'm curious, you know, if, if and this is where, you know, let's, we can use the chat throughout this if you want. I can't promise I'm going to be catching everything that comes in. But just to start off using the chat, you know, if there are climbs, if there are snow climbs, um, or here we go. Let me, let me advance the slide. I can. Oops. Um, that you already know that you want to climb, or reasons that you already know you want to climb snow. Go ahead and type them in the chat, and I'll try to just monitor that. And you know, maybe we can pull in some examples from those particular types of climbs. Or okay, awesome. People are ready for this. Baker, Sahali, Sahali again, Glacier Peak, Forbidden. Oh, love it. Ambitious one there. Um, so cool. Um, we'll have some some photos of at least three out of four of those of those climbs uh, in this in this lecture. So um, this is the outline what we're going to cover today. And it really all comes down to how to travel safely in this terrain, in this mountainous, snowy terrain where things could go wrong, right? It's about traveling on snow, um, the terrain, the hazards, the techniques, the equipment. It's about snow anchors and belays, techniques to use when the risk increases. It's about crevasse rescue if something, you know, starts to go really wrong. Uh, how to keep it from getting worse. It's about avalanches, managing that risk. And then at the end, we'll get into just what I think is some really just fun stuff is snow camping. Like it's so wonderful to camp in snow on the side of say Baker, Mount Baker, like somebody put in here, right? It's just a complete joy in its own right. So we should, we should revel in that, but we should also prepare for that because there are some skills that you're going to want to, to know to, to get into that. Um, no formal breaks in this outline. We do have um, a discussion group about 40% of the way through, maybe halfway through, where we're going to go into breakout groups. So that is where there'll be maybe a couple extra minutes if you need to take uh, a personal break during that time. Um, definitely don't plan on the full two hours that are allotted, um, but it's going to be hard to keep it to one hour, I think, too. So. <laughs> Somewhere in between there, we'll we'll see how it how it ends up landing. Um, okay, so um, first section of this this conversation: traveling on snow. And like I said, let's start with some pictures so that we can get 
some samples of the kinds of terrain and snow conditions that you may encounter on basic climbs. So as I click through these few slides, I want you to pay attention to the terrain and the snow conditions. You know, what kinds of hazards do you see? What kinds of things need to be paid attention to? Okay, so I think two people, was it two people mentioned Sahali? I started off with Sahali, right? How about that? Um, so this is on a, on a basic climb of, of Sahali Peak. Um, this is another picture um, pointed the other direction from coming down Sahali Peak across the Key and Saba Glacier. Actually, there's an awesome uh, basic climb called Shark Fin Tower that's kind of up out of screen in the upper right. And then Forbidden is, I don't think that's the summit of Forbidden, but definitely Forbidden is up there in the upper, upper left, Boston Basin. But again, I keep focused on what terrain you see, what hazards, what things we need to think about as we are a group of basic climbers are traveling through this terrain. <clears throat> Here's one from White Horse Mountain, which is a fun early season climb. The picture on the left is um, of a route that's not really done much anymore, um, perhaps for obvious reasons. The glacier that used to be there is not so much there, but it gives you a sense of what you can at least observe out there. On the right, this is the, the very summit um, of White Horse. Here on the left, we have South Early Winter Spire, which is up at Washington Pass. There's an awesome early season um, alpine snow climb you can do that goes up this snow couloir. Um, there's also a great slightly later in the season, you know, five, four or so rock climb that goes up this south rat. Pete, we can't see your pointer. Maybe oh yeah, maybe switch on the laser you. pointer. Thank you. Where where is the laser pointer? Not that. Well, I don't think I need to use. I'll I'll, I'll just skip the pointer. So. I'll, I'll use my words. Um, here we have uh, Mount Rainier, uh, and this is the Emmons route you can see on the left, the, which basically goes right up that rib in the center of the of the mountain. So that's something to to think think about there. Observe. We have Sloan Peak on the right. Might give you some ideas of some things to that we want to be careful of. Coming back from Black Peak, another really fun early season snow climb. What do you see here that weren't what wasn't in or other um, other photos? What hazard? Here's one coming out a uh, descent route off of Argonaut Peak, which can be a great yeah. Timothy, you got it. Water exactly. Um, coming off Argonaut Peak. It just shows you how complex some of the terrain in the Cascades can be. Like snow travel is not necessarily just endless walking on snow, like it can be in parts of the volcanoes, right? You might have a section of steep snow and then go back to rock and do a couple of repels and then get back on steep snow and then traverse across a ridge. I mean, these are this is complicated terrain where you might be having to put crampons on and off um, as you navigate different sections. Um, so what kind of hazards did you did you notice? Feel free to put them in the in the chat um, or we'll just sort of tick through some of them that I noticed here. Yeah, okay, Masha says avalanche, awesome. Um, <clears throat> Dangerous run out in exposure is one that I want to point out here. What does this mean? Run out means if you were to slide and fall, what's below you, right? Is it something that you're going to crash into like rocks or trees? Is it, Are you going to go off the edge of something? That would be more exposure. Are you going to be in 
uh, some sort of terrain trap or feature where snow could crush and bury you. Okay, I'm just going to catch up on the hypothermia. Excellent. Avalanche. Cornice, rockfall, yes, all of those things I saw. Um, in some of them, we saw crevasses. In the in that Kiansabe Glacier, for example, crossing from Sahali over under shark fin. We saw really variable snow conditions. This was maybe harder to see, but sometimes the snow is really hard and firm, what you might call neve. Um, other times, like on that that picture of the top of white horse, it's really soft and gloppy. It's going to stick to your crampons underneath. And so, you know, you can have this sort of very variable conditions even throughout the day that you have to be aware of so that you can manage it safely. Because if, for example, snow balls up, you know, makes a big consolidated ball stuck to the bottom of your boot under your crampon, your foot might just skate out. You might not actually have the traction that you're counting on there with that crampon. Um, snow bridges. A snow bridge is an area where maybe there is a stream uh, going underneath the snow that hollows out the area under the snow, um, making a, a cavern and the snow above it is a bridge, a snow bridge that then can melt out. It can get thinner and thinner. You may not know that you're stepping on very thin snow and snow bridge and you could you could fall through that can be minor inconvenience it can be catastrophic how do you know the difference when you start getting experience moving through snow you'll get a better sense of this um sun and uv like glacier glasses sunscreen both sort of mandatory because even if the sun's not fully out even if it's partly cloudy these things can be a real issue at altitude and when it, all of you get the extra reflected light coming off the snow. Um, weather, you know, can the weather change? Is that going to come in and really change your conception of what your climb was going to be leading to other risks like somebody pointed out in the chat, um, hypothermia. I liked... Um, and weather leads to low visibility, as Masha is saying. I like the person who said um, rockfall, right? You think is, is, is rockfall an issue on a snow climb? Potentially, yes, because sometimes these mountains are pile, big piles of rock of various strength and um, consolidation, right? Sometimes there might be loose rock that's only held in by ice and at 3 p.m. on a warm June day, when you've just climbed up a glacier and been coming back down, things might melt. You might get some rocks, you know, whizzing by. This can happen on, for example, Mount Rainier, disappointment cleaver. You're coming down, you know, approaching noon. Uh, it's just a pile of rubble frozen together by some ice, and rock can come off and be be risky. So. You know, these are the kinds of things that we need to prepare for and sort of understand how to um, adapt to as we move through snow. Um, this picture, what else? I don't know that bears are that much of a hazard, really, but Cascade Pass coming down Sahali, you know, there was a bear, took this sort of photo of the of the bear print. Kind of, they, you know, got to be aware of them. So this is a picture of... Um, terminology of terrain in sort of a mountain glacier environment. This I think is from past edition of Freedom of the Hills. I think there's probably something similar in the current one. But just take a moment and sort of scan down that list of words on the left because there are there's going to be terms in here that are probably new to you. Um, but it can be important to have a shared and precise terminology of what the features are in the landscape that you're in. Because as a group, you might be standing in a very safe, grassy hill, look, having this scene in front of you, right? And as a group, you're saying, okay, we want to get to that, let's say, peak in the upper right. How are we going to travel through this landscape to get there safely? We're going to go down. We're going to cross that glacial outwash plain, you know, hugging the lateral moraine on the left, going up the toe of the glacier, across those crevasses, bearing right under that 
um, couloir over to the sort of the cirque there going up past the Bergschrind to the right of the those those flutings in the snow on the headwall straight up to the summit right and you want the team to have a shared understanding of what those all those words mean and what what path we're going to take through that terrain it's a uh, it's a safety thing really it's also just a um, communication and enjoyment aspect of being in the mountains what are these features that we're crossing how are we going to navigate them so um you know i don't think i think if we were in really together having a discussion we could talk about what some of the terms are that are new to folks feel free to put it in the chat if that's of interest and you want to just share like, hey that's that's cool um but the thing i want you to take away from this is like you know this this stuff matters like you want to be able to talk as a group about um, where you're going, how to get there. And because things can change, you may not have um, good visibility later on. You want to remember that you're going to the left of those flutings because you can see the flutings close up, even if you can't see some of the other features. Um, you may not have uh, a GPS or appropriate navigation equipment at all times, you know, at your full disposal. You want to be able to read the terrain. It's really important. I think we'll skip the the discussion bits, but there's some useful some prompts to help you um, look at that, that that diagram. Okay, so let's get into um, you know what? Actually, let's go back to that diagram because I didn't show one question that I had up there. All the dangerous runout situations here, right? Look at all the ways that you could fall and slide and get hurt. You could slide off the end of the glacier. You could slide or fall into a crevasse. You could slide and fall into a berg shrimp. You could slide and fall into rock that's at the edge of the glacier. Um, you could slide and fall into sharp penitentes, you know, sort of sharp ice formations. So not to scare you, because we have going to have plans and ways of dealing with all of this. Um, but these are real hazards in real environments that you are going to experience on basic climbs. Okay, so now snow travel and techniques. And, you know, one of the biggest ones is um, really just observational, assessing that run out and the consequence. So in those run out situations we just saw on that, on that diagram, how severe is the how likely is the run is the run out is the is the fact that you might fall and what is the consequence of it right if you're sliding 10 feet down a 10 degree slope into a pile of marshmallows or grass like that's not that's one thing right if you're on a 35 degree um slope on mount rainier above a crevasse that could fit four school buses and you would never see them again like that's a completely different thing so you're going to need to, and you know, not on your own, right? You're going to have climb leaders. You're going to be in a team, but as a group, you need to assess um, what the run out and consequence is, and what techniques and equipment to use for each circumstance. The biggest thing, really, when it comes down to it, is just don't fall in the first place, right? And so that sometimes can be underemphasized, but we're going to start with that up front. Um, and then we're going to talk about how to move efficiently because that's um, a safety thing as well as a, as a fun thing. It helps you get to the summit more. So first one, how, in, in terms of how not to fall, is walking in balance. It's, it's called, you know, sounds kind of funny. You know, we all walk all the time. We're all, we're all in balance. But you have to think about it a little bit more precisely when walking on snow, especially on steep snow, especially when you're traversing, um, you know, one side is up and the other side is down. Because at any given moment, if something, some rock fall or some bit of snow or even, you know, a foot were to slip, the consequences of not being in balance are potentially much higher than when you're just walking on the sidewalk on the street, right? And so, if you can walk 
and take any pauses specifically in a way that is in balance, you just statistically just, you know, reduce the probability and chance that if something were going to happen, it's going to happen when you're out of balance. So this climber on the left labeled A is sort of the classic um, symbol of walking in balance. Um, sort of the, the uphill hand is out front and then the uphill left leg and then the, the right leg. It would be reversed if you're going the other way. Um, and this is actually a very stable position to be in, 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 instead of B, the second picture, where the climber is taking that step, of course the climber needs to take that step to move forward, but that is not a position of being really in balance or being resilient to um, any you know changes to your environment. When this class used to be in person, Jan and I would do a demonstration of this and try to push each other over standing in each of these ways and you know try it at home. It's remarkable how much more stable position A is. You know, put your your foot up on a chair or something and the ice axe up on a chair than is position B. Here's us a, a picture of, you know, a climber on Silver Peak, you know, sort of demonstrating that imbalance posture on the left. And another thing about um, being in balance is if you need to um, say pause and take a longer break because someone on your rope needs to drink water or something, you can very quickly go into what's called self belay where you put both hands on the ice axe like that climber um, at far right. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, step two of how not to fall is to wear crampons most of the time when you're on snow. Um, it's, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll hear somebody say, oh, well, do we need crampons? And I would say that that's maybe slightly like limiting way to, to think about it. The question is really like, are crampons going to be helpful in preventing a bad situation? Um, you know, it's, in some cases, it's going to be less of a of a pure need and more of just a pure risk reduction, um, which is really important. Um, and so wearing crampons in most cases, like we don't, don't want to necessarily get into exactly what kind of crampons, you know, most general mountaineering crampons um, will work for the purpose of, of this class. But, you know, most of the time when traveling on snow, you know, almost certainly when traveling on a glacier, you want to be wearing crampons on your mountaineering boots. Uh, another thing in how not to fall is self, self belay. So um, as I was saying earlier, like if you're going up diagonally up a slope with, and you need to rest for, you know, longer than a few seconds going into self belay can be helpful. Um, I see a question about crampons versus micro spikes. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, going into South Belay can be helpful just because you have that much more security in the, when you actually plunge your ice axe down, especially if the snow is firm, that gives you some, some serious leverage and protection on that slope. Um, and really, you know, there's different ways to hold an ice axe um, sort of in the US, it's much more common to hold it like climber A or climber's hand A um, than climber's hand B, which is a little more common in, in Europe. But really, either works. And um, you know, I encourage you on the snow field trips to try both of these and see what circumstances might be better for each, each grip. Personally, if when going straight up a hill, which sometimes is what you do, I really like um, grip B. Uh, as when whereas when going sort of up and diagonal on a slope, then I prefer grip A. And it's really about how quickly can I get the the pick of that ice axe into the the snow should I need to. So just one way to visualize that and is this this picture on the on the left here. And you know, you're not necessarily gonna need you're not gonna be on terrain this steep as in on basic climbs as the climber on the right high dagger. But low dagger can be useful. And you see that kind of orientation 
of the hand and the ice axe is easier to sort of go naturally into if you're using that more European grip than the sort of traditional American um, ice axe grip. Um, okay, other ice axe considerations, and then we're going to come back to crampons. So when carrying an ice axe, I mean, one question is, well, you know, when do you carry it and when do you, when, yeah, when do you carry it, basically? Um, and, you know, the answer is in many cases a judgment call, but here we're talking about basic snow climbs in the Mountaineers. And, you know, you're going to be carrying it most of the time, anytime you're traveling on snow where there's any likelihood and consequence of a of a fall um, and the ice axe like the crampons are, are best thought of as ways to prevent falling in the first place the ice axe and you will practice this is an indispensable tool at stopping a slide once you're already um, moving but that's a lot harder to do and it can't be counted on right you want to do everything you can to not fall in the first place. Um, you know, some of the other questions about whether you use a leash, um, you know, a piece of nylon, something that attaches the ice axe to your wrist or to your harness, um, or whether you don't, exactly what length, um, you know, those are more sort of personal preference. I mean, um, and, you know, we can get into that maybe later in the, in the Q and A if, if you want, but I'm not, I don't know that there's any, you know, hard and fast rules that I want to, or guidance that I want to communicate on that. Um, you know, similarly shaft and pick shape and the and the details, like, you know, there's a lot of different types and shapes of ice axes out there. That's, you know, really more of an advanced topic. Just a straight shaft axe is going to work well for this basic, um, basic class. Uh, you do always want to wear gloves, though, because you know, if you really have to use it, your hands can really get cut up by that snow. You don't want, um, you know, the snow to be digging into your knuckles and cause you to potentially let go of the, of the ice axe. Um, other crampon considerations. Uh, so first, let me just address the question about crampons versus micro spikes. Like, um, you, you know, micro spikes are generally going to be useful for patches of snow or ice on a hiking trail, like going up Mailbox Peak. Um, they're gonna be, you know, it's not that they couldn't be useful on a basic snow climb, it's that you're gonna probably be carrying the crampons because there are gonna be many more situations where it's really, you're just gonna need that extra um, length of the uh, crampon to get into any snow or ice and the micro spikes are not gonna cut it. So should we, you, you know, you carry both? Um, I mean, maybe that's a lot of weight um, for some, you know, pretty specialized um, application of the micro spikes when the crampons would, would also do. So I don't think I've personally ever, ever carried both, but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean it's not possible or perhaps uh, a useful idea at some point. Um, other crampon considerations. So sometimes they come really, really sharp. I think different brands um, can be different on this, but you know, if it's too sharp, sometimes that's really designed for ice climbing and it can sort of very easily snag and, and catch on and rip your your pants, um, your rain pants or other pants. So, you know, some people recommend filing down the the front points and maybe the um some of the, the other points near the near the front, but um, you know something to just think about, talk with your SIG leaders about. Um, another thing that really helps avoid snagging because that is a hazard in its own right. If you trip on your own and your crampon catching on your own leg, that can be a, a risk. Um, are are using gaiters or um, you know at least snugly fitting gaiters? Like I don't know how they're fitted these days, but the OR. Gators used to be really baggy, and they almost like almost like it's not it was not helpful, right? I need a more of a trim, tight um, interface between my pants and my boots. So you know, 
these are something to probably buy in person at a store more than online because you really want to fit it all and make sure everything is is snug. Um, fit both the you know fit crampons and gaiters to boots ahead of time. Crampons are adjustable in, in many dimensions often, and you don't want to be the one at you know two a.m. on the side of Mount Baker. Your crampons don't fit on your boots, right? You want to be dialed just like all of your other uh, climb team members. Um, you know, it takes some practice sometimes to walk well with crampons, to walk and to not snag. So again, these are what the field trips are for. Let's practice these skills. Uh, you can buy crampons often either as aluminum versus steel. Um, steel, much more durable, um, a bit heavier, uh, definitely more versatile um, because of its because it's harder, it lasts longer, it does better. If you need to go on a little section of rock, it does better um, in firmer ice. But there's a place for aluminum crampons as well. So something to talk about in your in your SIGs. And I said it once, but I'm gonna say it over and over again. Like stopping a fall by wearing crampons and walking in balance with your ice axe is so much better than counting on stopping a fall with a self-arrest. Um, Again, we're going to practice self-arrest because you need to have that muscle memory to do that. But it's something that you, you want to apply other skills to avoid having to do. <clears throat> um, OK, so how to move efficiently. And this really can vary depending on where you are in the season and what the snow conditions are like, right? Soft snow, um, winter and early spring, you know, we're still kind of in that time, it's going to be more important to have flotation, something that allows you to ride on top of the snow and not sink in. So snowshoes, um, skis, if that's something that, you know, you're good at and know how to do, um, you know, th that's important. You know, you need to, to move efficiently. You need to not sink into the snow. Um, so um, whereas later season or different elevations, right? You're going to need those crampons. And, you know, early season, you might need both. I mean, you might need, for example, on Mount Baker, take those snowshoes for a couple thousand feet um, until you, you know, transition into the, the crampons, depending on, again, that exposure, the run out, consequence, um, what the snow conditions are, are like. But I guess I will say, like, I think typically by, I mean, this varies by which peak, by season, by year, but, you know, by the time that many of us are actually going to be going on day six climbs, like snowshoes often end up being more trouble than they're worth to, to carry. And you can get by with, with mountaineering boots um, and crampons because that snow has become consolidated through many cycles of freezing and thawing. Another important aspect of how to move efficiently is when, when going up, when going up steeply and going up um, either upward at a diagonal or straight up is this concept of kicking steps. So assuming you're climbing up something that, that hundreds of people haven't yet already climbed up, someone, especially that first person in your team is going to be with their boots actively kicking in the toe to make little platforms to go up. And if that first person is seven feet tall and the, someone later in the team is five foot two, it might not, it might be a challenge for that five foot two person to step up and step up as high as that seven foot person who picked the steps. So it's actually a really important team consideration how high those steps are. If you're leading, think about how high the steps should be because you're kicking them in and the later team members are gonna be reinforcing those steps so that you make these nice platforms that everybody can move efficiently on. Um, so if you're first, think about the rest of your team. And if you're in the back and you're five foot three and the six foot six person is making steps that are too big, holler, say, hey, like, can you make the steps less high? And the person will do that and everybody will be happier. Um, take turns in the lead, so rotate, 
through as you're going. You know, the first person has a little more work to do, pick those steps, and they might get tired. So, you know, set a, a rotation or a cycle if you want. So first person goes to the back, person two steps up and leaves. Then, you know, you do that every 15 minutes or something. It can really preserve the team energy for getting up the mountain. Um, and, you know, you don't, don't feel like you need to push it too fast because you want to, in many cases, you know, you're climbing Mount Rainier, Mount Baker, Glacier Peak, Sahali, El Dorado, you know, these peaks that we've talked about, you, this is an all day affair. You need to maintain an all day pace and think about, you know, that everybody can do that and that nobody's going to be, be burning out because you're all going to be roped together. You can't go any faster than the, the slowest person in most circumstances. Another aspect of moving efficiently um, in going down is something called the plunge step. And this is super fun um, and can be disorienting at first because you really have to lean forward more than you think you really should to maintain um, that the momentum of your foot going sort of straight down into the snow and not going at an angle where it could sort of skid out in front of you. So you need to sort of counteract and avoid that chance that your feet might skid out and send you sliding. You need to lean forward and really be almost aggressive, like putting the weight of your full body down on each leg as it, as the heel kicks, you know, as, um, plunges, it's called plunge step, into the snow like this climber um, on the left. Yeah, be honest. Similar to skiing, you'll end up on your butt if you aren't leaning forward. So, um, it's it's it can be disorienting at first. Once you get it, it's super fun. Um, it's very can be very fast, and it can be faster and safer than what many people consider the alternative is glissading. So glissading, you, you know, can be fun because you're basically sliding on your butt down. Uh, a sh you know, down the snow, down a little loose track of your own making for hundreds of feet. Um, and yet, you can't see as well what's ahead of you in that circumstance, right? There could be a snow bridge, there could be thin snow, there could be rocks, there could be, I mean, even a tiny rock, if it's well lodged in there, you know, you sliding over it with your, um, fancy Gore-Tex pants or whatever, you know, cuts your pants, could cut you, and worse. I mean, you know, every few years, somebody dies on coming down Camp Mirror or coming down Asgard Pass from the enchantments, um, early season, glissading, and they don't see that there's a hole, and they go into a, a waterfall that's under the snow, and they can't get out. So, not saying glissading isn't doesn't have a place. It does. Um, it generally makes more sense to come down something that you've already gone up, you've inspected, you know it's safe, you know there's not very much went out, you know there aren't big snow bridges, then it can be a good way to come down safely um, and efficiently. So is punch stepping in that circumstance. So um, again, things to try in your snow field trips. Um, some other considerations that may be less obvious in terms of how to move efficiently in snow. Um, one is just clothing and packing. How do you maintain your kit? You can go by. <laughs> Somebody's crawling behind me. Um, layers that can be added and subtracted. So, you know, having a good layering system of, um, you know, of insulating layer of perhaps a wind shell of uh, a puffy and of a hard shell, you can sort of take and add those, take those, take those off, put those on, take them off um, as needed can be really useful. So you don't have to take one layer off in order to put another layer on. Um, you want to generally start off cold, you know, in the morning at 3 a.m. or whatever, climbing Mount Baker, because you're going to heat up quickly um, and sweat is your is your enemy in these circumstances. Sweat is going to what makes you cold and leads to hypothermia risk. So um, especially when you're going to be hiking, carrying weight uphill, 
start off with fewer layers on than you you think, um, and then have them at the ready to put on when you when you stop. Uh, food and hydration. Um, so keep eating and keep drinking. Keep quick calories in your pocket. You know, gummy bears or shop blocks or cookies or whatever it is. Like keep those calories going in because again, if you're you know spending eight hours climbing Mount Rainier, like the times when the full team stops for any length of time are very rare. You need to keep the big picture and the long view in mind and keep getting calories in your body. Same thing with water um, because you know you need energy and you need to stay hydrated on these climbs. A hydration tube can be really helpful. Like I was a water bottle guy and I thought hydration tubes were silly and I got a hydration tube and then all of a sudden I was just constantly sipping way more hydrated. I love it. Um, and then another aspect of efficiency is just is is communication. Like um, like we talked, you know, like that example at the beginning where we were looking out over that that labeled chart of the different parts of the mountain. Like having everybody have a shared shared set of the route of expectations um, lets people manage their own bodily needs um in a way that's most efficient for the group right so part of that might be taking a planned rest break you know every hour for example so every hour you know you know that on the hour you're going to stop and you're going to be able to go pee or get out your sandwich um and so then you know nobody is is trying sort of inefficiently to make that happen or ask for you know a break that, that, that everyone else has to then stop um too for like so, you know, work out these systems that keep everybody moving um, and yet let people take care of their 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 needs. Um, and then as I kept as I kept saying, like the last resort is the the self-arrest. Um, and there's this sort of trade-off because you know, when you most need it, it can be most difficult, right? You're on if it's very bulletproof, hard snow, steep terrain. Like, thankfully, I've only fallen in that kind of situation ever once, but I was, you know, and I wasn't wearing crampons. I thought I was doing something trivial. I didn't need to. My feet were out from under me. My ice axe was out of my hand before I knew it, and I was sliding on uncont uncontrolled way down the slope that thankfully didn't cause me any lasting injury. But it was shocking how quickly this stuff can happen in the conditions where you need it most. So you know, you're going to be practicing this on the field trips on more forgiving conditions. That's great, obviously, um, because you want to build that muscle memory of what to do if you fall. And that's essential. Um, but as I'm saying for the, you know, millionth time, like, this is not something to count on, like wear crampons um, in circumstances where there's any serious consequence or probability of a, of a fall. Um, and then, you know, lastly, uh, just one thing about moving um, efficiently and safely can sometimes be moving quickly. Um, Mount Rainier, this is a picture, you know, coming down Disappointment Cleaver on the solstice one year, and it's, it's hot, right? You don't want to be coming down in a situation where things are really warming up, softening up, big blocks of ice like these could be moving, like, it's actually a safety thing about, you know, how quickly you can get up and back down again. Like, you know, obviously not to the point where you introduce new risks, um, but as a team, you know, knowing how a mountain or how conditions are gonna change throughout the day and making a plan to be in the right place at the right time, because the alternative is not good, right? Um, and knowing when to turn around if you just can't make you know, if you can't make it up in time to get back. So um, something, to, something to think about. Okay, now we're gonna move on to uh, the little group exercise. And this, we're gonna have breakout groups of a few people. Um, and I think that Jan emailed this ahead of time. Uh, so you should have seen a, a PDF handout about this. Uh, 
the, the question for you, well, okay, here's the setup. You're gonna be climbing a peak in Olympic National Park. It's called Mount Cruiser. It's a wonderful climb. It's a, it's a rock climb actually, um, but it has some snow potentially on the approach. It's mid July, it's gonna take two or three days. Long approach, 7.5 miles one way to where you camp. Forecast is high in the 80s, nighttime low in the 50s, partly cloudy overnight, clearing by morning. Um, the handout has the route description from uh, an Olympic climbing guide, it has a, a topographic map. And then I want you to imagine in your breakout groups that you're at the trailhead. By the way, the trailhead doesn't have cell reception. You don't have a satellite phone. I don't, you're not Googling here, right? You're looking at the information you have at your disposal, the map, the weather forecast, the, the route description. You're gonna discuss the pros and cons of bringing in crampons and ice axe on this long approach on this this climb and then it's sort of a you know if you get through that and you find have some interesting discussion you know also maybe think about if and when you would actually use these things will you also put on harnesses and use the rope right you're already having planning on bringing the harnesses and the ropes at the rock climb so are you if you do bring crampons and ice axe how are you going to decide if and when to rope up so that's the assignment. Take you know several minutes in small groups to talk that through. Um, the Liana and Jan and I and Peter um, we may pop into your groups. We we may not. Um, we haven't quite decided that yet. So um, have at it. And if you have clarifying questions, I don't know. You can put them in the chat. Put them in the chat and we'll see yeah. them. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I will stop recording. All right, welcome back, Mount Cruiser climbers. Um, do we have any volunteers to give us a sort of a summary of your discussion about the pros and cons of bringing crampons and ice axe? Any, any great volunteers? You can just go ahead and, and unmute and... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, this is Jackie. I'll start. We uh, discussed, you know, at the trailhead, there's no cell coverage, making sure everyone had maps, compasses. Um, and then as far as the discussion on pros and cons of bringing crampons ice axe, based on the information provided in the maps, we all agreed on crampons, and I think we were somewhat split on whether or not uh, ice axe would be necessary. Definitely, of course, the harness and rope was coming along. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit about the discussion about whether or not to bring the ice axe? Um, there's a icy section. Uh, and Marsha, Marsha, do you want to speak? Yeah, 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 yeah. So my uh, kind of kind of thought process was thinking back to scrambling course. We, I feel like I cannot really self arrest on uh, ice. You know, it's like hard, right? So then I can self arrest on a spot on a snow. Plus the angle is seems to be really steep. So I don't really see myself self arresting with ice axe in this particular terrain. Uh, I see myself like you know roping up and and crampons, but like I just didn't really. Um, no, how would I self arrest if there is only eyes? Uh, that's what my thinking was, but I may be wrong. So I just never self arrest with eyes uh, in our course. So I'll be curious to hear what other people recommend. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll comment on that, but I I like what you are, are suggesting about let's let's hear from other groups too. And, and okay. I mean we don't we don't need to hear from everyone, but is does any other group want to um. I, uh, I can for, jump in. Uh, yeah. I can jump in. Hassan is my name. And so basically, uh, we basically thought that, yeah, it's a good idea to bring both ice axe and crampons. Our, our thought process was the following. Um, because it was too warm, we thought that there may be basically blocks of ice or avalanches or something like that. And so an ice axe may be a good thing for to keep us anchored. Um, 
And uh, for uh, crampons, we saw that maybe because of all of this uh, uh, melting, there may be a thick crust of ice forming, uh, possibly. And so crampons will help us move on top of it. That was our thought process. We could be wrong. We also had some ideas that maybe all the avalanches would have gone by now and maybe our assessment is wrong. And so the, if something um, wanted to slid, it must have slid already. Um, as for ropes, our, our process was that it's a good idea to bring ropes uh, because uh, you know ice bridges and whatnot may be very soft. And so if somebody falls into a crevasse, you want them to be rescued. Uh, but we also had this other thought of if there's an avalanche, is it a good idea to be roped uh, in an area where there's an avalanche? And so we had many questions uh, that, that we were not sure about, honestly. Um. OK, good. That, thank you. I'll respond to some of your points as well. Um, is anyone else, especially if you have a, a different um, assessment than what we've heard so far? Would anyone from our group like to speak? Uh, sure, I will. Um, looking looking at the last few lines of that description, um, especially the one saying uh, you are going through a really icy chute that could be that could be icy still, and also turning north and traversing um, traversing up uh, could could end up traversing a section of snow that always lying north, um, not melted or not soft. Um, therefore, crampons, yeah, on hard snow or steep terrain. Um, ice axe, um, yes or no. But uh, I think I think both of us agreed that um, the, past, the, the path of least regret, like carrying another 500 grams uh, versus like ending up in a situation where you don't have it. Um, the, the trade-off was worth taking it. Excellent. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so, I mean, from our three samples, you all had very productive and very real conversations about the trade-off. So that, that's great. That was the point of the exercise more than to necessarily arrive at a, at a correct answer. I mean, the things that I heard that, um, that sort of jumped out at me as being really useful are um, thinking about the, 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 the temperature, thinking about the aspect north facing, um, thinking about the steepness, um, thinking about the, the iciness of this potential couloir. Um, and I didn't hear anyone mention the, the map, but if you look at the topo, and you sort of connect that with the description, you know, you can sort of see, I'm not sure I want to take the time to go do it now, but go look at the topo and find it. I mean, it's a pretty tight, very north facing um, feature. So that means it's not going to get, um, a, have gotten a lot of sun. Um, it's fairly unlikely to be really soft snow. Um, we're into mid-July, so not that anybody should have known this, but by mid-July, the chances of avalanches are going to be fairly small because things that were going to slide probably will have slid by then. And by contrast, there will be have been a lot of time for snow to melt and even just a little bit and refreeze, melt and refreeze. And that's what consolidates snow down to being very dense um, and ice-like or icy as the description said. So, I, I mean, I, I think it's it's pretty clear to me here that crampons are a must. I think everybody more or less came to that conclusion. Um, I would say ice axe is a pretty strong must too. Like if you're gonna be using crampons, um, uh, an ice axe is gonna be pretty important as well and, and not, be necessarily because of the self-arrest thing, but because of the balance, that walking and balance part that we talked about. Like you need that ice axe as that extra third um, piece of balance and, and the, the sharp bits of the ice axe to use to um, 
to keep yourself safe on a steep snow slope when you stop even momentarily. So, um, you know, I would I would encourage you to 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 bring both of those on this to not get distracted by the fact that it's a long approach, to not get distracted by the fact that it's it's hot. Um, and here's one other sort of subtle point about the description, like nighttime lows in the 50s, partly cloudy, clearing by morning. So lows in the 50s with a clear night, if those actually ended up being lows in the upper 40s and clear, like snow can get really firm in those conditions because clear sky allows that heat to actually radiate back and really firm up that that snow and you're going to be probably going up that in the morning you want to leave you know after you camp at flapjack lakes you want to leave the whole day for this rock climb to be successful you know you're going to be going up at sort of the worst most icy conditions in this in this couloir. And so here, here's an actual picture from an actual climb in mid, in mid July of that, of that couloir. Um, it's, it, you know, it's hard to gauge the steepness. This is on the, on the left. It's hard to gauge the steepness, but that's snowy and that has some run out. Like those are big boulders that would really hurt you if you slid into those at the bottom. Um, it ended up being so snow, so icy up at the top there. And we did have, Isaac's crampons, but we we repelled off. We found um, some some tat, uh, you know, a sort of a makeshift repelling and repelled that top section because we didn't feel comfortable down climbing it on the way out. And and also in the actual description of the climb, I blacked it out in the description I gave you, but it says bring Isaac's crampons. Um, so you know, I wanted you to come to that decision on your own and and you did so bravo um and these are the kind of conversations that you know you you may have or at least thought process you should be having on these climbs the photo of the on the right is the actual summit block such a cool climb 5.0 like not a difficult rating but you go up that left skyline of um of mount cruiser so um my, not a not common lesser known climb uh but it's a basic climb um and you could potentially do it in this course all right we're going to move on from that um i don't see any other you know questions or anything in the chat but thank you for taking the time to have those conversations all right now to some 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 technical um gear related stuff snow anchors and belays so when the risk of a fall increases in likelihood or consequence. Um, you know, the assumption here is you're roped up, you've got ice axe and crampons on, but maybe you need to be attached to the mountain uh, in addition. So here's a picture of what that can look like. This is, uh, again, a team coming down um, off of the top of Rainier towards Disappointment Cleaver, which is a basic climbing route. Um, and you, you can maybe make out the sort of two ropes on the left here. Um, guides, the guide services will place pickets in, uh, you know, these metal bars in steep sections, and they will attach uh, a rope there that's meant to be, you know, sort of like a, a hand line. Um, you know, where your free hand is to use it isn't always clear, but, you know, they, they may have their clients clip into it. Um, but here you see the art team, uh, if you can make out the green rope, is not clipping into that um, that picket, into that protection. We feel like we didn't need it. But more to the point, like this is actually in very soft snow at this point of the day when we're coming down. Like that picket may not hold our body weight. But the, the point of the pickets is, is to attach your yourself to the mountain so that if everybody falls um, or you know even some people fall there's no chance of everyone getting or it reduces the chance of everyone sliding off the mountain um, here's a diagram from um, freedom of the hills eight I think it was and you know just sort of showing how that can work where you're traveling you're concerned about 
I don't, I don't know. Did they, does this team just come up over this complete ice cliff in the lower right? I don't know. But I imagine they did. Yeah, they might want to put pickets up in so that they don't fall back down um, below that thing. Um, pickets like this really only work in hard snow, what you call neve, you know, the snow that has that like hard, like styrofoam, like, like quality, um, or snow, you know, that's hard enough that you can really compress it and consolidate it your, yourself. Um, we'll get to that in a second when we talk about anchors. So pickets are pretty common to take on basic climbs. Um, flukes just on the right, which is more for uh, softer snow. Personally, I haven't ever seen one of these on a basic climb, but could actually be a good idea. Maybe some people take them. I'm not entirely sure. Um, we don't necessarily need to get into the physics of picket placement. That's a more sort of intermediate topic. But just to say that put, placing the picket vertically, you know, hammering it or pushing it in is generally the best way to, to do it. Um, the only exception is when the snow is so fluffy that it, you can't make a snowball out of it. And in that case, then uh, placing it horizontally and burying it down is, is kind of what you have to, to do and, and then just hope. But vertical orientation is generally best and generally best to clip it in the middle if you can dig a, dig a, a slot um, because Again, because of physics that we don't need to go go into, but um, clipping on the top is often pretty is good enough, especially in neve type snow. Um, so the you know the the natural question then is if you're anchored to the mountain, you know, are you also then belaying? You know, are you sometimes repelling in snow? I mean, yes, I would say. It's relatively rare, but you, you should always consider it an option. Um, you may practice in the field trip or in your SIGs, you know, making these anchors in snow called bollards or digging or, or, or placing pickets. Um, you know, I mean, in Kravosvesky, we'll talk about that too. Like, pick, you, you know, you need to make an anchor, you need to make a bomber way that you're attached to the mountain so that your whole team stays on the mountain so that you can perform crevasse rescue so that you can rappel down over some difficult um, sequence. And in certain circumstances, if you feel like you want a belay on um, a particularly challenging section on a glacier climb, you know, if on Mount Rainier, like this photo on the left on the Emmons Glacier, you're stepping over, you know, such a big crevasse that you feel like it could feasibly, you know, reasonably be a fall, then yeah, maybe you want to have put have someone else put a couple pickets in and belay you out using a belay device or some other way of, of doing it so that to maintain tension in that rope, just like you would on a rock climb. And yes, exactly. Don't be afraid, as Liana says, to ask for a belay on a climb. Like if you're if you if you need it to climb safely, then it should um you should ask for it and it should be provided to you. Um, so I don't think we won't really have this as a discussion, but it is a discussion that I'll have among with myself in front of you, I guess. Should you rope up, um, and please, uh, others contribute in the chat. Should you rope up on steep snow if you aren't placing pickets or other protection? This is sort of a perennial debate and question, and it's very circumstance dependent. But take a look at this photo, right? This is Mount um, Shuxon approaching the summit pyramid. This is what it would look like, you know, say if you were potentially coming up um, Sulfide Glacier, that's a basic route, or Fisher Chimneys. That used to be a basic route, or is it intermediate? I can't remember. Either way, um, you get to this pyramid, it starts to look like this. And if I had, um, where is Nancy? Here, can I do this? So here we go. Oh yeah, is that working? Um, going across here and then up where these people are gathered right here. 
there's this sort of steepish snow um, gully there. You can see how many people there are here. You can see how at least these people um, are not roped up. But, you know, it's a steep couloir. There are lots of rocks. If you fell, bad things could happen. Um, you know, should a basic climb rope up to go up that couloir? And the reason I pose this as a question rather than as something that has an obvious answer is because there are real trade-offs involved here. Like imagine a team of three goes up there, roped together, um, they don't place protection, someone falls, the whole team goes sliding, now they have this clothesline between them that, 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 that pulls other climbers down that aren't even in their team with them. And you've created a much worse situation than you started with, right? You've, you've endangered other people that aren't even part of your team. Um, so, you know, one solution to that would be we'll place protection. And yet, you know, maybe it's difficult to place protection. Maybe, um, you know, maybe the, con the, the likelihood of a fall is so small that the group feels like it's not worth the extra time. Like um, maybe, you know, everybody feels confident enough in their own abilities that you actually don't rope up. You rely on each person as an individual to manage themselves with the ice hacks and the crampons. Um, these are all potentially valid options. Like there's there's no necessarily right or wrong answer. Um, and you know, not everybody in the group is going to have the same um, confidence, same risk tolerance. And so it really just comes back down to communication um, and, you know, people talking about what they're, they're comfortable with and what the climb leader thinks like is the good practice for the day. But, you know, there have been real circumstances where teams that are roped together have fallen like on Mount Hood. Uh, I think this even happened with the basic, you know, years ago, basic mountaineers climb and pulled other people down you know, with them. So, you know, that's where your sort of obligation, not just to your team, but at least, you know, your obligation as a climber on the mountain with other climbers starts to become something to, to think about. So, you know, I would say in general, um, gosh, you know, is, is there, is there in general? I mean, in general, you know, you're not, you're going to be roped up as a team of three on most basic glacier climbs and you're, you're not going to be placed in protection, right? You're counting on the competence of each of the individuals and you're counting on the competence of, um, of the team to self-arrest should one person fall. Um, and I think, you know, that's going to be the right answer most of the time. And yet, you know, there are going to be situations like a couloir on Chuckson or like the south side of Mount Hood in certain circumstances where it may make sense not to rope up because um, because of the extra risk that that introduces um, to others on the mountain. It, it feel free, um, you know, Liana or uh, anyone else to to jump in. It, here, it here, is a difficult here. thing to yeah. to think about because you know you can rely on your own teammates and your own decision to not rope up or to rope up or whatever but you have no control about anybody else that's on the mountain so for places for example like mount hood which is just a mess of climbers all the time even, even with permits i mean you can't control if you're not roped up and then somebody else is roped up and then their entire team clothes lines you off the mountain. Like you're, you, you're not in control of that. So it is a really difficult discussion. Um, so I guess, you know, just making sure everybody in your group is comfortable with whatever the decision that it is that you're making um, is probably the best way to handle that. I yeah, don't know. Thank you. 
tough. And, and I mean, you know, I bring up these kind of gray areas um, very much to, to encourage thinking um, and, you know, d discussion about these things, because I think, you know, there aren't hard and fast answers for many of these things. These are real questions that you'll face, um, that you may face on, on climbs, and you want to, you know, not be blindsided by the ambiguity, right? Like, at least when I, sometimes I'm learning something new, like I want things to be black and white so that I can get my bearings in an unfamiliar situation. And, um, you know, I think you want to just, I, I want to be anyway, um, it sounds like Liana too, like upfront about where there are, where there are choices that need to be made. Um, and these are sort of the, the poles that, uh, the axes that that choice lies on. So. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe one more thought could also be that uh, the areas where you want to place protection are possibly dangerous areas. So you want to get out of them quickly and placing protection takes a lot of time. So that's something you need to uh, put in consideration. How much extra time does it cost to make things on so to some expect safer, but also you're, you're exposing the entire team to more time in the dangerous area. Absolutely, especially if rock fall, for example, yeah, is, yeah, a, yeah. is a concern, or yeah. even other people, you know, yeah. that are above you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, or if conditions can't warrant you placing protection where you mm -hmm. normally would. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, we're going to go to yet another topic for which enter to crevasse rescue for which I need a different slides you are screen sharing am i sharing the no i probably need to share change oh, no it is that looks no that's not right stop share restart share okay illustration to crevasse rescue this, um, these are some slides by Dayling Wren from the Mountaineers. Um, and I wanna say a few things before we go into these slides, because these slides are very much about the technical aspects of, of setting up a rope rescue. Um, that is best done in, in person, hands-on, so you can really understand how to do that. Um, and yet, we want to give you an introduction to the concepts and to, um, you know, the various types of, of ways you might set this up so that it's not completely new when you go to it at the field trip. And I also understand some of the SIGs may have already started this, but we want everyone to have a sort of a shared understanding. Um, so with that, let me say there are a number of ways that you may have to do something like rescue someone from a crevasse, they're not all catastrophic. They don't all involve um, setting up fancy rope systems. Like, you know, it is, it is the, the, the basic, you know, way this happens is a team of three is traveling on Glacier Trevane, you know, say Mount Baker in May, and there are crevasses that haven't yet fully opened up, meaning you can't see them yet. You know, they're, they have snow bridges over them. The first person in your group of three, say, that goes across it may have a foot punched through or two feet punched through, um, but they don't actually, quote, fall. You know, there's not a free fall into this giant yawning maw of ice, right? It's something less dramatic than that. But you don't want it to get worse, you know, your climb leader has just is now up to their waist in a crevasse and you correctly have self-arrested, you know, and kept it from getting worse. What's the, you know, that that is, that's the real situation that's happened to me. Um, and it was quite casual, right? I was like, oh, hey, oh, are you okay? Can you get out? We're in self-arrest. Do you need us to pull the rope? No, no, I think I got it. You know, 30 seconds go by, the person has clawed their way 
out of the bad situation and everything's fine, right? Like that's one way it may go. And the reason I bring that up is that communication with the person that's fallen and just assessing the situation are really going to be the first steps, no matter which of these sort of technical routes you end up going. You may not need those technical routes, right? You may be three teams of three and everyone can join forces to just pull on the rope while that person self-extracts them from the crevasse. So this is all to say, don't get scared by crevasse rescue as a, as a topic. Don't get scared by, um, um, you know, the, the, the diagrams in here, because it will make sense. Um, and as Leanna says, it's extremely situation dependent. Um, and in terms of how you get yourself through that situation. So all of that said, an illustration of crevasse rescue. Um, the situation is, as I said, you know, you've roped up for glacier travel. Um, you're generally a team of three. There's a certain amount of rope between you. Often each person on the end will have extra rope to help with the rescue. Um, having that extra rope provides you flexibility in terms of being able to set up pulleys or other ways of using mechanical advantage to help pull whoever it is that falls in, in, sorry, out. <laughs> um, somebody falls, often it's the person on the end of the rope, like the first person in my example of walking across Mount Baker on a, on a crevasse that hasn't yet opened up. The first step is the other two people immediately go into self-arrest to keep that person from falling anymore. By the way, I'm skipping the bullet points here. You can read them if you want or look back at them later, but we're just trying to get a big picture sense of how this goes. So I'm really just focusing on the bold text in these slides. Okay, once you've self-arrested and gotten everything all right, you know, communicate with the climber. Like, hey, what happened? Are you okay? What do you think you can do? Can you get out? You know, et cetera. And, you know, that may involve approaching the climber safely. We're going to, be, there's techniques where you want to minimize the slack in the rope as you approach that climber so that any additional fall or any fall that you take is not further catastrophic, right? You want to be, um, you want to be minimizing slack at all times. You want to be then, you know, before you do any weighted rope work, you want to set up an anchor with those pickets that the intermediate students or maybe you are carrying um, or maybe ice axes or anything you can do to bury and make a really bomb or anchor. Um, and because that, again, it attaches you to the mountain, keeps the whole team from going into the crevasse should something unexpected happening happen. Um, once you build an anchor, you basically, you know, make sure you're attached to the anchor. That's just backing up the friction hitch. You don't need to get into what the friction hitch is quite yet, but it's a prusik that's attached to the anchor. You want to back that up with an actual knot of some kind so that there's a knot attached to the anchor, not just a, a prusik. Um, more communication with the phone climber. Hey, we're coming to we're to get you. We heard that you, you told us you couldn't get out yourself. We got this. We're coming for you. Like, don't let that climber freak out, you know, any more than they need to. Um, you know, and then you're, you know, you're going to assist the climber, attend to any um, horrible injuries first, right? Stop the bleeding or do what you can to provide any first aid before you try to get them out. Um, and then that's, you know, when you get into the situation of, okay, how are we going to actually extract this climber? You know, do you have six other climbers hanging around? You can just pull. Um, that's, that's, that should always be an option. Um, you know, having the climber even before, you know, having the climber ascend the rope on their own is always an option. Use those Texas prefixes that you've practiced. Um, uh, you know, can they ascend the rope with assistance? Um, another option is, you know, can you just drop a loop and do what's called a two to one or a drop C loop 
colleague, much easier to set up than more advanced systems? Or, you know, do you need to go to a three to one mechanical advantage to really get as much force pulling up on that climber as you as you can? Um, you know, you generally you know want to wade into these situations by doing the less complex um, option that will get the job done. But these are this is just the introduction. This is really all I wanted to say about Kravas rescue. Um, and you know, I think we have some great diagrams here. I don't blame you if they look um, complicated on first first time you're seeing them. But it will make sense, and it will make sense with with practice, and it ends up being even kind of fun. So um, that's it on Travas Rescue. We will stop the share and go back to this. Okay, you see managing risk from avalanches. Yep, thanks, John. Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there, folks. Um, okay, so it's avalanches are a very complicated topic. Um, and the most important thing I want to impress upon you is that, you know, confirmation bias or well, confirmation bias can be deadly. And so here are some observations that, you know, you you might say, I've certainly said, I've heard, you know, you're there looking at some slope that you're not sure about. And like, well, you know, so-and-so crossed it safely an hour ago, or, you know, I know Jane has been here before, or I haven't heard of any recent avalanches, or I don't see any avalanches. Like those are natural things to think and say, they actually aren't that relevant to whether there's going to be an avalanche when you cross that snow slope, right? We need to think more about the fundamentals of the snow itself and whether that snow could slide because these are low probability, high consequence events that our brains are don't see happen they don't see them all the time that's confirmation bias right all these we, we saw we saw nothing bad happen our whole day how could something possibly bad happen next well it can and it doesn't care about the fact that your whole day was great so far so you really can't there's a risk in even talking too much about avalanches in such a short amount of time right because you can't learn everything about avalanche safety safety in one evening yet alone seven minutes of a of a lecture right but what you can learn and what i want to try to convey are just some important like fundamentals of avalanche safety which are is like first and foremost you know terrain selection like are you going into avalanche terrain um avalanches are most frequent on slopes between 25 um, and 60 degrees, and really most common between 35 and 45 degrees. If it's steeper than that, it's so steep that snow ever, never builds up. If it's shallower than that, it's, it's shallow enough that anything that starts can't gain the momentum, enough momentum to keep going as, a, as an avalanche. So, you know, there are, you know, some compasses have dip needles that let you assess terrain angles, but even more in, Importantly, you know, ahead of time, understanding from looking at maps, from looking at online tools that shade, that color the slopes, like CalTopo or HillMap, they'll color the slopes according to the different avalanche terrain angles, so that you're planning a trip and a journey through the terrain that is going to minimize your exposure to or avoid entirely any avalanche terrain. Another one that's more of a really a social skill is is communication and how you work as a team. So when you take, you know, the avalanche professionals talk about this a whole lot, like when you're sitting out 
as a group to travel together in avalanche ter terrain, agree that you're traveling as a team, right? And agree verbally, say it out loud. Like I am going to speak up if I say something, if I see something that concerns me, right? Just saying that at the trailhead makes it more likely that you will do so later and challenge people's assumptions, right? If somebody says, well, gosh, you know, Bob went across that slope yesterday and he lived, it's like, you have to say, well, you know, okay, how, how relevant is that actually? You know, challenge assumptions of your own and of others and do so verbally. And then agree to respect anybody's veto. If someone's not feeling it, they may have good reasons for that. They may even have good reasons that they don't feel comfortable sharing. Um, so if your goal is to be safe in avalanche terrain, um, these are ways that you can stay safe in avalanche terrain. Um, there are other resources to, to, to look at to learn more. I mean, definitely classes, um, ARI classes, um, Northwest Avalanche Center, we'll look at that in a second, um, mapping tools like I, like I mentioned. Um, this is a map of, um, this is from, from Northwest Avalanche Center. This is from April 4th, I think. Uh, no, this isn't April 4th. This is from earlier this week or last week. But they show different regions of the Cascades. And you can click on each region and it'll tell you about the avalanche risks and forecasts in that area that are going to be for the next 24 hours, say. So um, April 4th today wasn't that interesting. So I went back found an April 4th from a previous year that was super interesting. You know, NWAC said, you know, today's avalanche danger isn't worth overthinking, et cetera, et cetera, a bunch of stuff you can read. You know, avoid, for this reason, avoid traveling in areas where avalanches can start, run, and stop. So basically, stay out of avalanche train today. Don't overthink it, which means don't justify a poor decision through some other, you know, rational um rational means and you know this is kind of just what what you want to hear right and the the forecast that went with that on that april 4th was red so considerable avalanche danger at middle and upper elevations that they they go into you know what kind of avalanche is that going to, going to be how likely it is how big it is the aspect and the elevation meaning what parts of the mountain um or of the terrain i should say it's it's great ways to to think about where and how you can avoid avalanche terrain. Um, just an incredible resource. Uh, so that said, there are also some things you can learn to really avoid in avalanche terrain. Um, one of them is cornices. So we've seen examples of this earlier. Here is just a massive cornice that I took a picture of. This is um, taken from the base of that South Early Winter Spire climb looking back at the Blue Lake Bowl. Um, I mean, just this massive cornices with these giant blocks coming down. You might say, what's the avalanche risk here? Well, the avalanche risk is not just those blocks, but the fact that those blocks are way, you know, many tons, it is like literally a bomb dropped on that snow field. And if there's weak layer under there, that whole thing could go. Um, I've seen it happen. So you know, avoid the cornices, not just because that they could actually fall and hit you, but they can create avalanches in their own right. Another thing to avoid, um, a different, completely different kind of avalanche, pinwheels or rollerballs, when you see so snow sort of almost on its own start rolling and developing um, rollerballs or the sort of pinwheel features, um, that means that, you know, loose, wet avalanche, a different type of avalanche is a very real possibility. Like avoid that kind of terrain when that when that's active. Um, some other things to think about are just, you know, the slope and the solar aspect matters a lot. Solar aspect is, is it facing into the sun or not? Um, you know, is it a south, southwest, um, west aspect in spring? Um, you know, March and April, as temperatures get warmer, as days get longer, those um, can be aspects that are really dangerous. Um, avoid terrain traps and cliffs, you know, anywhere where an avalanche could trap you, suffocate you, push you over something, push you into something. Um, beware this whoop 
sounds that can or, or cracks that can indolate can indicate a slab that's settling or breaking and that could act as a big consolidated mass and slide. Um, beware rapidly warming temps, especially in spring, because those can activate weak layers in the in the snow and they can create these loose wet avalanches. Um, favor ridge lines in travels, not bowls. And like I said, if anybody's feeling it, um, trust your instinct because the mountain is always going to be there. So, you know, at peril of giving you just a little too, you know, just enough to be dangerous on avalanches, like that's all I'm all we're going to say now. Um, I will say, like, most basic climbs, because they are happening in, you know, mid May and beyond, are going to be outside of the range where most avalanches occur. So you want to be familiar with these things, especially as you go out and adventure on your own. Um, and there may be things to raise in your in your group settings. Like it's unlikely that there are going to be serious issues on any of the basic climbs um, related to avalanches. Okay. So last topic. Um, fun one and I see you know we're we're 100 minutes in so we'll we'll keep this we'll keep this brief um but snow camping it's so fun um it's just a great aspect of these these especially these volcano climbs on basic in this course um this is a you know for example uh making camp on a climb of Mount Baker and you know some of the like obvious ways that snow Camping is well different than summer camping. Uh, it's cold. Stuff is heavier. Um, but there's less obvious ways too. Like it's a great surface to camp on. Um, but tents can be more difficult to set up. Site selection is more critical. Like you want to really think more about wind because um, the wind can blow your tent away. Um, you know what shelter you bring may not be as obvious because you know the true winter tents four season tents are heavy um that you know if you're going and climbing up and over sahali peak on an overnight most sahali climbers are day trips but if you're going up and over you know this is there a risk that you're just going to be carrying too much stuff do you want to go with a lighter setup that isn't as robust to the full winter conditions but it is is lighter and still big enough like a pyramid shelter or something lots of options the point is to select you know shelters you know consider these trade-offs and select shelters um that meet the needs of of the trip that you're going on um you know lots of cool ways you can do camp craft and make tables and benches and kitchen tables and all kinds of stuff um, in the snow, you know, I love it. Um, here's a picture of, you know, an overnight climb where we did carry over on a mountain um, and camped at the base of the climb in a pyramid shelter. So it was nice to have a lightweight shelter that could sleep three and only weighed two pounds as opposed to, you know, in other circumstances, um, you know, I might prefer four seasons tent, like in this picture, it was relatively easy or, you know, less demanding objective. Actually, this is an excellent basic rock climb, Ingalls Peak Southridge in the upper right there. Um, uh, you know, still under a lot of snow in mid-May. Um, and, you know, it can be, can be wonderful. You can be the only people out there to go camp um, and, to, you know, have a, take a more robust shelter if you're not concerned about um, moving quickly. So in general, you want to seek, you know, wind protection, you want snow that's deep enough that you can kind of do some camp craft and build in, you know, shelves for your gear if you want. Um, you want the snow deep enough that you can really anchor it very well through, um, you know, skis or ice axes can be great or those sort of fat pieces of fabric that you can put a snowball in and then bury it. Those are much better. Normal tent stakes are not going to be useful in these kind of circumstances. You know, avoid any places where avalanche terrain um, or run out. Avoid slushy places. Um, 
you know, in many cases, a 15 degree sleeping bag is, is plenty good in the Cascades. You do need, if you're gonna camp on snow, think even more about the sleeping pad, you know, sort of get to an R value of five, whether you combine that, combine a couple pads or get, you know, one of the sort of really expensive Thermo X Therms or other brands make similar ones um, that is R value five all in itself. Um, we talked about clothing systems a bit. Uh, it takes extra fuel, extra time to melt snow for water. That's n n maybe not obvious, but it's really important that you take enough fuel and you plan enough time in to melt that fuel so that you have water to drink. Um, you know, dedicating a group bathroom area helps keep the mountain clean. Pack it in, pack it out, usually in terms of the solid wastes. Um, and, you know, it's just a joy to be out there. So that really is is the end um so glad that we got we covered so much um ground in this talk really i love being out there and paraphrases one of the my co-sig leaders when i took the course you know be safe have fun learn something and you know maybe get to the summit getting to the summit is 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 less important than being safe um and having fun and there is something when it comes down to it at the end of the day. So thanks a lot. Um, I'll turn it to Jan and any others who have comments about logistics um, from here if needed. Um, I'll just put my name again and email address here if anybody has individual questions. But thanks again.